there are a lot of impacts in our society that illegal immigration brings to us, and it's not a victimless crime, which is kind of what we're told. Oh, you shouldn't worry about these people. They want to come in. They're looking for a job. They're going to help America. And aren't we all immigrants ultimately? And isn't that how our ancestors? Those kind of arguments are generally presented to us. But the reality is illegal immigration is having a terrible impact on our country. Just look at these headlines. This is just last week, uh, both of these articles. Justice Department panel approves asylum for domestic violence. The Department of Justice Board of Immigration Appeals has decided to let Guatemalan women, I'm not sure why it's just Guatemalan women, but Guatemalan women win asylum in the United States if they claim to be victims of domestic violence. The decision creates a huge new incentive for Guatemalan women to cross the U.S. border because if their asylum claim is accepted, their children get U.S. citizenship plus the use of federal health, education, and retirement programs like Social Security, regardless of their initial education work skills or any payment into the system. They get offered a free lunch. Who's paying the bill? You and I. Enormous impact. And uh, consider this next uh, headline. And this is the uh, same date, August 27th. Department of Homeland Security seeks transportation services for minors. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency renewed its search this week for transportation services for unaccompanied children crossing the border into the United States. An earlier notice posted in January, so that's a while back, seeking escort services for an estimated 65,000 unaccompanied children raised questions about the Obama administration's prior recognition of the effect that the news of its Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals plan would have on primarily Central American parents who mistakenly believe their children would benefit from the program. So again, our taxpayers' dollars, I'm told in my county by people who are in the know that more than a thousand children have come from the border to be housed in Anne Arundel County. Joe's sister works in a summer program. These summer programs are costly, and she had three, at least three that she could count of these unaccompanied minors who come into the border that have been transported to Maryland, being housed in Maryland, their foster parents being paid on the dime of the taxpayers in Maryland, and they were going to this summer camp, and the summer camp was being paid for as well. It has an enormous impact in our economy and in our lives. The crisis on the border of these unaccompanied minors is really tragic if you look at the situation. In fact, I think, and I'm going to share with you I think why, but I think this is a planned attempt to pull the heartstrings of Americans because Americans are very generous. Americans are willing to help. Americans are moved by the plight of children on the border in this situation. And Department of Homeland Security said there's an unprecedented deluge, and actually the number is much bigger than that. They were reporting 52,000. It's probably over 60,000 at this point. Unaccompanied minors, and they were able to cite when it began. October 2013. In other words, before October 2013, there may have been a few here and there, but there was no deluge of unaccompanied minors showing up at the border uh, in America. There was no problem. So you have to ask, why not? Why not 10 years ago, all these unaccompanied minors? Why now? Well, doing a little research, there was an executive order, a very obscure executive order, two months before the deluge began. Just enough time for that news to get down to Central America and for those people to begin moving northward. And this executive order, number 11064, facilitating parental interest in the course of civil immigration enforcement activity, you know, government speak. Really, when you look at it, though, notice the, the, what it says here on page three of that document. FOD shall continue to weigh whether an exercise of prosecutorial dis discretion may be warranted for a given alien and shall consider all relevant factors in this determination, including whether the alien is a parent or legal guardian of a USC or LPR minor, that's these unaccompanied minors, or is the primary caretaker of a minor. That last phrase is the important phrase in this executive order. That is, if you were an adult and you had an unaccompanied minor with you and claimed that you were this primary caretaker of that unaccompanied minor, guess what? You get a free pass. You will not be deported if you come into the country with that minor and claim that you are the primary caretaker of the minor. The resulting evidence is two months after this executive order was put into place, that's when the flood of all these unaccompanied minors began. 
And the evidence is that people are actually renting these children in those Central American countries in order to get a free pass and not to face deportation or any problems getting into this country, they can have a free pass as long as they have that minor. Of course, once they're into the country, they dump the minor because the minor is no longer of any use to them. And so that minor is in the country without any support and the problem is just multiplied. You have to think about what they are doing because this is, I mean, this is evil. These children are being used in what you know, you could really call human trafficking. And our government is actually encouraging this human trafficking and rewarding this human trafficking in children from Central America. It's truly evil what, what they are doing. Who took that information down to Central America? Oh, well, you could be sure. <laughs> you could be sure the, the, where, did, where did that information, or how did it get to Central America? You could be sure they had this all planned out before this executive order was issued, that it would be widely disseminated so that the flood of children would begin as part of, of their plan. And of course, as we mentioned already, when these kids come in, and some of them are not young children, some of these are teenagers, all sorts of diseases, some diseases that have been eradicated in America for a century or more, for the first time, are being reintroduced to our country. In fact, those thousand kids that are in my county, Anne Arundel County, are now, for a week, they have been attending public school. So if they carry those diseases with them, they immediately expose that whole population of children who expose their parents, basically exposing the entire community to these diseases. Not to mention that many of these teenagers are already part of very dangerous gangs. The MS-13 gang is one of the most bloody, deadly gangs in the world. And the evidence is many of these MS-13 teenagers are actually coming into the country. And those that are not part of those gangs already are being recruited into those gangs. And the evidence is clear. We are importing a great deal of crime and violence into our country. But again, the heartstrings of Americans are being played. Oh, these poor children. Don't you care about them? Don't you want to see them clothed and, and fed and, and all the other things? This is a sign that's uh, down in Arizona. Public warning. Travel not recommended. Active drug and human smuggling area. Visitors may encounter armed criminals smuggling vehicles traveling at high rates of speed. Stay away from trash, clothing, backpacks, abandoned vehicles. If you see suspicious activity, do not confront. Move away. Call 911. Bureau of Land Management encourages visitors to use public lands north of Interstate 8. That looks like this if you look at the map. Interstate 8 there. That whole section of southern Arizona, south of Phoenix, and uh, west of Tucson is the area they're saying is very dangerous for you and I, American citizens. Basically, they're saying, we've given up on that area. We're not going to police it. We're not going to patrol it. You're not safe if you go down there, and you're on your own. Uh, we don't recommend you do that. Very interesting that we're giving up whole pieces of our country, and law enforcement is not going to enforce the law there. So what happens when this crisis develops? Say, just looking at the state of Arizona. Well, you all know what the state of Arizona, the Governor Brewer, decided we're going to follow the law. We're going to see that the immigration laws of America are applied in the state of Arizona. We can't control New Mexico or California or any other state, but we in the state of Arizona can do something about this. We're going to follow the law. And you saw exactly what happened when they followed the law. The response of the administration is, uh, Arizona here is saying, I think the law should be obeyed and that only those people with proper documentation should be allowed in the U.S. And the administration points a finger and says, a dangerous, divisive, racist. In fact, we're going to sue the state of Arizona to prevent them from implementing following the law. What's going on? We have criminals running our country in Washington, D.C. And the criminals in Washington, D.C. are refusing refusing to follow the law of the land. Well, if they violate the law of the land, they're not the government. They're, I don't know what you might call them, a mafia. But they're certainly not acting as the government. They're acting as criminals would act. So we have enormous problems. Alan West has identified some of the impact this made. And this was actually, he stated this a little while ago, so I think the numbers may be even worse today says since 2010, the administration has relaxed immigration enforcement. I think that's almost a euphemism. Relaxed immigration enforcement, almost none. Encouraging, instead of uh, doing any enforcement, encouraging illegals to come to the borders. 
And uh, he says, even though the annual supply of new labor, 4 million American youths, roughly 600,000 working age immigrants and roughly 800,000 foreign guest workers far exceeds companies' demand for extra labor. What's the impact? In response, household wages have dropped since 2010. And nearly all of the income gains since 2010 in America have gone to the wealthiest investors. The average American, the middle class, it, their standard of living is falling in this past four years. The only the richest are benefiting from uh, these, uh, these actions on the part of our federal government. Well, let's step back a bit and look at the big picture because migrations of human beings from the very dawn of time have been part of the human pattern. And in fact, when you look at the migrations in the history of our world, just consider uh, how many empires have fallen as a result of human migrations. The Roman Empire, as powerful as it was, because of human migratory patterns that were taking place, ultimately led to the d demise of that empire. It wasn't the only thing. The empire was weak and the empire had all sorts of problems, but those human migrations of the Goths and Visigoths and Ostrogoths and the Huns and most famously the Vandals ultimately destroyed the Roman Empire. And I think that's an interesting and, and really good comparison for our thinking today. Why is it? Because it's quite clearly the administration wants illegal immigration to take place. It's encouraging, it's it basically inviting. We'll give you freebies, come, and we'll give you all kinds of goodies. Come, we want you in our country. Why would they do that? Well, they know that immigration can be used as a weapon to destroy an empire. Think of that in, our, in terms of our country, because we're gonna come back to that point in, in a few moments. We are, at this point in the history of our country, no longer a republic. We're a republic on paper. Our Constitution says we're a republic. Article 4, Section 4. We're supposed to be a republic, by law a republic. But we haven't been functioning as a republic, oh, for 50, 80, maybe even 100 years at this point in time. Clearly, when we have military bases in 130 countries of the world, what's that? What's well, an empire? That's what Rome did. Oh, yeah, they had bases in Britain, they had bases in France, they had bases all over the world, and they were a worldwide empire at that point. We're even far bigger than the Roman Empire ever grew in terms of controlling much of the world. Much of the world is controlled by our Federal Reserve, an illegal private organization that has uh, uh, gutted our economy and controls our economy. They control the whole world through the dollar. So we are a world empire now. And so you have to ask the question, wait a minute, if they're trying to destroy the empire, what, you know, what's their purpose? What's their reason for doing so? But we'll come back to that in a moment. But just to make a note, when we think about migration, human migrations take place all the time. When people realize that there's better opportunities economically for them and their families and their future in another location, then they're gonna migrate if they're permitted to do so. Here's an interesting chart that illustrates the flow of migration into the United States and out of the United States. The only one that's out of the United States is the red one there, and that is primarily going to Europe. There are a significant number leaving the United States for Europe. But notice the vast migration from Latin America into the United States. And then there's from Southeast Asia, there's a significant portion as well as East Asia, a significant portion uh, coming into our country. So the vast migration, however, is from Latin America into our country because that's the easiest way to get into the United States, not to come on the water borders, but to come across the southern border, which is no longer protected. It's as porous as it's, as it's possible to be. But when we talk about migration, most people who believe that the immigration pattern is fine and it's fine to break the law, they do so because they say, don't you realize that we're all immigrants here? You know, we all migrated. Our ancestors migrated here. We have a tradition of immigration. My first ancestor, John Whitney, immigrated in 1635 and uh, settled in Watertown, Massachusetts, and we spread out from there. But uh, all of us at some point came into this country. Our family came into this country, even if you have any Native American blood, which I do have a little bit of Native American blood. Ultimately, they came probably across the, the water or either if not across the water, across the frozen Bering Strait or something like that. So we do have a tradition of immigration into our country. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free and so forth. Yet in our legal system, there's a very restricted structure built into it regarding the powers related to immigration. Our constitution is very clear who has that power 
and very clear as to what that power involves. And it is in our Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 4. By the way, if you ever want to know what powers we gave to our federal government, we the people in our states gave these powers to our federal government. They're listed in Article 1, Section 8. There are a few other powers mentioned elsewhere, but Article 1, Section 8 has the primary list. If you want to measure anything that Washington, D.C. is doing that's a violation of our Constitution, usually the first place to look is Article 1, Section 8. Read those, I believe there's 18, some would say there's only 17 in that list. Eh, a little quibble there, no big deal. Read those 18 and see, is education on the list? No. Therefore, does the federal government have any power legitimately to collect money from any citizens in the country and spend it on education? No. It is theft. Every time they spend a penny, and now they're spending billions of dollars in the Department of Education, every time they spend money on education, they are stealing from the American people. They're criminals, a mafia, if you will. Now, notice what Article 1, Section 8, Clause 4 says regarding the powers that we, the people, have granted to the federal government. Congress shall have power to establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. So the important question is, what did they mean by this term naturalization? We may think we know what it means, but we need to ask them, what did you mean? And the quickest way to discover what our founders meant by the words they used is to go to Webster's 1828 Dictionary. In fact, Webster said in the introduction to that dictionary, part of the reason he penned that dictionary, the first American dictionary, was so that Americans could know what the words in their founding documents meant. Because he recognized that sometimes people twist and they change the meanings of words over time, and therefore you might know not, not know what it means a hundred years later, but you could go back and read the dictionary that they all uh, uh, ascribe to and understand what those words mean. So let's look at Webster's 1828 here on the article of naturalization. The act of investing an alien with the rights and privileges of a native subject or citizen. So it's a legal decision to say this person wasn't born here, hasn't grown up here, is not a citizen here, but we're going to take them in as an alien and we're going to give them all the rights and privileges as if they were a native or uh, born here or subject or citizen. Naturalization, he goes on to say, in Great Britain is only by act of parliament. In the United States, it is by act of Congress vesting certain tribunals with the power. So when we're talking about immigration and naturalization, we're actually talking about two separate subjects. And the Constitution only speaks about naturalization. That is, the process of deciding how a person is permitted to become a citizen and therefore permitted all the privileges and rights of a citizen. The Constitution, notice, does not say anything about immigration. It only speaks to the subject of naturalization. So it says nothing about powers granted to Congress to determine anything regarding immigration. Now, that's an interesting insight, at least as I studied this, because I was led to believe all along, oh, immigration, that's under Congress's powers. They can determine what and not and make laws and pass regulations and so on, but nah, not according to our founders. It was only naturalization which they had the power over. And so the question is, do the states have any say? Have they retained any powers in this area? Well, the 10th Amendment answers that question. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it, that's by the Constitution, to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So what power has been given to Congress here? Naturalization only. What about immigration? What does the 10th Amendment tell us? States. It's the state's purview to deal with the issue of immigration. That each state can make a determination on its own, separate from the other 50 states, as to what it's going to do about immigration. Now, Congress can say, well, yeah, you can allow these people into your state, but they don't have the right to cross the border into the next state because the next state has its own immigration laws that says, no, sorry, those people who came in to your state, you said they were fine for your state. We say, no, they're not fine for our state. Each state could have its own immigration laws, but Congress would set the rules for naturalization. Any of those immigrants that came into the country, how do they become citizens? What's the path to citizenship? How long do they have to be resident? All those questions are to be answered by Congress. We have granted them the power to do that. Now, another significant part of our Constitution is the 14th Amendment, because the 14th Amendment does relate to this issue. It was passed by Congress in 1866, ratified 
questionably uh, in July 9th, 1868, and I don't know if you're familiar with a little bit of history in our, in our course, our U.S. Constitution course, we do teach the details as to what took place there with the 14th Amendment and its supposed ratification because when it was first proposed, passed through both houses of Congress, there was a real problem there because some senators were not permitted to be seated to give a vote on this. So an illegal action took place in the Senate prohibiting certain senators from voting on this. That's illegal. That's unconstitutional. They can't do that. But nonetheless, they send it through both houses and then they send it on to the states. Now, how many states or what percentage of states? A little constitutional quest. Three quarters. Three quarters of the states had to ratify the 14th Amendment in order for it to become part of our Constitution. And when it was passed out to those sta states, three quarters did not ratify it. For example, Texas, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, North Carolina, Arkansas, South Carolina, Kentucky, Virginia, Louisiana, Delaware, Maryland, Michigan, Ohio, and New Jersey all voted against the 14th Amendment. Said, sorry, nah, we're, not, we're not for that. We don't like that idea. And then what did Congress do? It was ruled by a bunch of tyrants who said, we're not happy with that. You know what they did? They took the military and sent the military, not to any of the northern states, not to New Jersey or uh, Ohio or, or Michigan, but they sent it to the southern states, the 10 southern states that had voted against this. You know what they did? They deposed the governments of those southern states. Removed the governor, removed the state legislature, the state judges. They deposed the governments. And what did they do? They established a puppet government that the, go that the government was supported by the military. In other words, the military forced a coup in all of those states. And then the puppet government they put in place went ahead and ratified, quote unquote, the 14th Amendment. Now I ask you, does that seem a constitutional way to ratify any amendment to our Constitution? No. In fact, there were some states that protested. And they sent some protests up to, to, to Capitol Hill, and those protests were ignored. And they sent some protests to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has never ruled. There were several opportunities for the Supreme Court to rule on this, whether the 14th was properly ratified or not. The Supreme Court has refused to ever take a case to deal with that, uh, that question. So let's look at what the 14th Amendment says, at least in Section 1. All persons born or naturalized in the United States. Let's pause there because this leads to the question about Anchor babies, you heard of anchor babies, you know, a woman stumbles across the border, gives birth to a baby, well, that baby was born on the soil of the United States, therefore it's a United States citizen, which means privileges and so forth accrue to the mom and the dad and so on, and they can, you know, bring in their relatives because this baby is now an American citizen. That's a false interpretation of the 14th Amendment, because notice the next phrase, all persons born or naturalized in the United States, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. It's not enough to just be born on the soil of the United States. You must be subject to the jurisdiction of the United States in order for there to be citizenship attached to you being born in the territory of the United States. Uh, and it goes on to say, are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. And, you know, the issue that was really being addressed here by the 14th Amendment was that slaves who not only could not vote, had no citizenship rights, the 14th Amendment was saying those slaves have been set free by the 13th Amendment and now we're going to recognize them as citizens. Perhaps those who crafted the 14th Amendment should have done a better job of making clear who they were addressing. That they were not addressing anchor baby issues, that they were not addressing uh, anybody who stumbled in. But this phrase, subject to the jurisdiction thereof, is significant. That is, if a person is a citizen of, well, let's just pick a country. They're a citizen of France and they're over here on vacation and a woman just happens to give birth a little bit early, you know, she's eight months pregnant, she give birth to the baby, and I'll say they're visiting New York City. Does that baby become an American citizen suddenly because she's on vacation? Well, I don't know. What's, what is sh that baby subject to the jurisdiction thereof? France, because the parents are French and not Americans. So I don't think this is the anchor baby thing is a proper interpretation of the 14th Amendment. And so what the 14th Amendment did, however, is you see it brought power to Washington, D.C. to decide who the citizens of the various states were. You see, when we hear the word citizen, we normally think of, oh, citizen of the United States, right? That's what we normally think. 
Well, before the 14th Amendment, people never referred to themselves as citizens of the United States. They would refer to themselves as citizens of Pennsylvania or citizens of Maryland or citizens of Virginia. In fact, uh, Robert E. Lee, when Lincoln asked him to uh, uh, fight against his own people in Virginia, said, I cannot fight against my own country because it was his country. He was a citizen of Virginia. He would not fight against his own country. So you need to understand that citizenship in the state was primary and because you were a citizen of a state, well, of course, you were a citizen of one of the United States, and you had privileges and immunities under the U.S. Constitution because you were a citizen of one of the United States. Very different perspective. Following the 14th Amendment, now, the federal government is telling the states who their citizens were, saying, you have to accept these and these and these people as citizens. Now, initially, of course, that only meant the, the former slaves were now being declared they are citizens. But the potential power here that we'll see used in the issue of immigration and naturalization is that the federal government ultimately began to tell states, those people that broke into your state and are illegally residing in your state, you may not want them, you may not like them, you may not want to pay for their education or any of the other things, but we're going to force you to because we're going to declare those people who illegally broke into this country, they're citizens and you cannot do a thing about it. I think our founders would find that a very disturbing pattern. They wanted states to have a wide-ranging group of powers and the federal government to have very, very limited power. Why? They recognized tyranny happens when you have all power centralized in the hands of one group in Washington, D.C. And the balance to prevent tyranny happening in Washington, D.C. is to be sure that each of the states have a wide-ranging power. And one of those powers was to decide who your citizens were. And for example, in Maryland, before the 14th Amendment, there was a standard for citizenship. And you might be shocked to hear what that standard was. You had to believe in a God. As if you were an atheist, sorry, you could live here and your rights would be protected, but you're not going to be a citizen. And I'll explain a little bit why that's important. Secondly, you had to believe that God's law, the Bible, is, is the law, the supreme law. And thirdly, you had to believe that there's eternal rewards and punishments. In other words, there's heaven and hell. Well, there's a lot of people who claim to be Christians that don't believe that. But that was the standard for citizenship, and yeah, it might be different in Virginia, it might be different in New York, it might be different in all of the states. And you might say, I don't like the standard Maryland has. Well, you have freedom to vote with your feet and go to a place you like the standard of citizenship. But each state had its own standard of citizenship, and the agreement, kind of one of the reasons why there's no religious test in the federal constitution, is that each of the states had their own religious test. That is, they would determine who could become a citizen, therefore who could vote, and therefore who could hold office. And the federal government said, it would be wrong for us to mess with all of those standards that each of the states have established for their citizenship. It'd be wrong for us to homogenize all of those and create one from Washington, D.C. No, 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 we ought to allow the states to have freedom to establish their own standard and follow that standard. Well, the 14th Amendment began the destruction of that, saying the federal government is now going to tell the states who their citizens were. And so up to the 14th Amendment, that point in time, there really, we're going to see from the history here in the timeline, there really was no challenge, there really, really was no attempt on the part of the federal government to control immigration. The states controlled immigration. And the evidence here is in this case in 1875, just uh, seven years after the ratification of the 14th, Henderson v. Mayor of New York decision declared, this is a Supreme Court, declared all state laws governing immigration unconstitutional. That's because the states, New York and other states, had their own set of laws regarding immigration. Those laws differed from state to state, but now, with kind of the 14th Amendment under their belt, the federal government is laying down the hammer and say, your immigration laws, we are now going to destroy them and we're going to create a federal standard of immigration and you states have nothing to say about it any longer. And it goes on, Congress must regulate foreign commerce and part of foreign commerce they're saying is bringing people into the country who are going to work. Is that foreign commerce? Doesn't that kind of sound like trading slaves? You know, well, you know, these, these people, these workers are a commodity and so Congress is going to regulate them under foreign commerce? To me, that, that, that smacks of a wrong attitude towards those workers. And the interesting thing is, the appeal to the Supreme Court came from charity workers. Charity workers who were burdened with helping immigrants who came into the country, and they petitioned Congress to exercise authority and to regulate immigration. And Congress said, well, we really don't have legal authority to do that. And so the Supreme Court entered the fray and said, oh yeah, we'll give you legal authority to do that. 
and then Congress prohibited convicts and prostitutes from entering the country. Well, I agree with that decision. That's a good decision. But I believe it should have been at the state level that decision was made. No convicts are coming into our country. No prostitutes in our country. Uh, they are not permitted uh, to immigrate. Well, look at the contrast of what took place before the 14th Amendment and after the 14th Amendment in terms of the actions uh, from Washington, D.C. 1790, Congress adopts uniform rules so that any free white person could apply for citizenship after two years of residency. So they're setting rules for naturalization alone. We might not agree with their standard, but regardless, they're setting the rules just for naturalization. Uh, eight years later, the terrible set of bills known as the Alien and Sedition Acts, a complete violation of our God-given rights, it required 14 years of residency before citizenship uh, could be obtained, and they provided for the deportation of dangerous aliens. And it's interesting to see James Madison, often called the father of our Constitution, and Thomas Jefferson's reaction to the Alien and Sedition Acts, you can read them, the Virginia and Kentucky Resolves, where they basically say, if the federal government passes a law, and that law is in violation of the Constitution, we, the state of Kentucky, and we, the state of Virginia, are not going to obey that law. They basically said, Alien and Sedition Acts, we nullify them, we flush them down the proverbial toilet. Washington, D.C., we thumb your nose, our nose at you, we're not going to obey your illegal legal unconstitutional actions because you don't have any right to rule in the area of immigration is what uh, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison were saying. So it's not my opinion, uh, I hope you see, that I'm trying to present to you. It is what our founders, father of our Constitution, and Thomas Jefferson were clearly saying regarding the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, and this was changed in 1800 to a five-year residency required. So again, the rules they're setting Congress is only setting rules for naturalization. Then in 1819, the first significant federal legislation on immigration includes reporting of immigration and rules for passengers from U.S. ports bound for Europe. In other words, if you're going on a vacation to Europe, there's certain paperwork they were saying you've got to fill out so that when you come back, we know that you are a U.S. citizen and so on. And so you, you might say they're, they're moving a little bit into the realm of, of immigration, but not exactly. They're not doing much in terms of immigration, just uh, asking for reporting uh, purposes. So perhaps they're okay in, in doing so. So up to 1819, there really wasn't anything significantly done. Um, you can follow it there on, on your sheet. Not, nothing significantly done in terms of stepping over the boundaries of naturalization into rules regulating immigration. But all of that changed after the 14th Amendment. We've already looked at the case there, 1875, and a flood of immigration began five years after that decision. And you have to wonder whether news of that decision, it took a few years to percolate over there in Europe, but one of the biggest waves of immigration up to this point in time in the history of our country began in 1880, and for that decade, 1880 to 1890, a huge number of people percentage-wise came to our country. Our country was 50 million people, and 5.2 million immigrants entered our shores during that 10-year period. That's 10% uh, of the population. If you can imagine our country of 300 million today, 10% would be 30 million immigrants coming in. And I'm not sure anybody has an accurate number on the illegals in America today. It might be up to 30 million, I don't know. But we have had a huge wave. But in that day, they began to wrestle with this decision made in 1875 has had this impact. Now there's huge numbers of immigration. Why? Congress is now in charge of setting rules, according to their own standard, rules regarding immigration, not just rules regarding naturalization. Look what they began to do. 1882, Chinese Exclusion Act, first federal immigration law, suspended Chinese immigration for 10 years. No Chinese can come in. Barred Chinese from U.S. citizenship, also barred convicts, lunatics, and others unable to care for themselves from entering. I agree with that. If somebody's not able to care for themselves, they're going to come in here expecting welfare. Sorry, we don't need you. We don't want you. We're not going to support you. Stay in your own country and work out your problems there. Don't bring your problems here and expect us to pay for it. In fact, I like what they did here. And again, there's some good decisions Congress made, even though I disagree with the principle that they had the power to make them. They placed a head tax on immigrants. You're going to come into our country? We're going to tax you because we're going to be sure you're not going to get on the dole. You're not going to be on welfare. You're not going to have us pay for your existence and for your medical and for your education. No, no, no. In fact, you're going to pay us if you come into our country. We're so right yeah, we are. We're paying for them. Yep. Three years later, contract labor law, unlawful to import, un import unskilled aliens from overseas as laborers. In other words, if they don't have any useful skills that are going to help our country and build our country, sorry. 
why don't you stay where you are and work out your problems in your own country and don't bring your problems here? These regulations didn't pertain, oddly enough, to those crossing land borders because in 1885, very few people came over land routes into our country. Most everybody came from the sea. Most everybody came to a port if they were going to enter our country. Uh, legally or even illegally. 1888, for the first time, provisions were adopted for the expulsion of aliens for 100 years after the Alien Sedition Act. Now they begin to say, wait a minute, ah, we were letting all kinds of people into our country that uh, this isn't a good thing. For 100 years, there hadn't been that problem. Why now? Well, Congress had taken control of immigration. It was no longer in the hands of the states. While it was in the hands of the states, there was no mass flood of immigration and there were no problem immigrants that they were saying, well, hey, there's some bad people here. We need to get rid of them. We need to deport these people. When it was in the hands of the states, that was not a problem. Why? Because government is always best that is at the local level because the people are able to be watchdogs on their government and see that it is doing the right thing. Now, quickly now, just some of the other ones. 1891, Bureau of Immigration established. So here's the federal government expanding their bureaucracy. It's like, oh, now we got all these immigrants. Now we got all these problems. That's what Washington does. Whenever there's a problem, we'll create a bureau. We'll hire a bunch of people. We'll tax the poor citizens even more to solve the problem that who created? Washington, D.C. created the problem, and who's going to solve the problem? Washington, D.C., but on your dime, not on theirs, on your dime. More classes of aliens were restric restricted, those who uh, were monetarily assisted by others for their passage, which is an interesting point. If you got somebody to help pay your passage to come here, sorry, we don't want you. In fact, they said steamship companies had to sign a, a, an agreement that if the Immigration Bureau ordered them, they would return that potential immigrant to their home country. So at the port, they were deciding, hey, did somebody pay for your, your passage here? Sorry, get back on the ship. You're not entering our country. Uh, you're back to your country of origin. 92, Ellis Island opened, and most people don't hear much about Angel Island, which was on the other coast and was widely used just to screen and prevent Chinese from entering uh, our country. It's interesting, they said that women traveling alone must be met by a man or they would be immediately deported. I think this was to prevent prostitutes from coming into our country was uh, the purpose there. Chinese Exclusion, Exclusion Act in 1902, 1903, I like this, anarchists, anarchists are not welcome. Polygamists are not welcome. Boy, we add sodomites to that list, I, I agree with that. And beggars are not welcome. You're gonna come here and beg from us, sorry. We close our borders to you. You cannot come into our country. You are inadmissible in our country. And you know, some people might say, well, David, that's kind of heartless. I mean, here's somebody that has desperate needs. Why don't we just open our doors and help them out? The problem is, that's not the job of civil government. God's word gives us a very limited role for civil government. Two jobs, essentially, of civil government are these. Establish justice. That is where God's law is being violated. Somebody's stealing something. Somebody's committing murder. They will enact the punishments. They will establish justice by punishing injustice. Secondly, defend the borders. Not only from military invasion, but also from illegals invading. That's their job. That's what they're supposed to be doing. So, yeah, it might seem heartless, but it's not the job of the government to be, heart, uh, to be merciful. Not their job at all. Other governments are to do that. Church government, family government, self-government. If you feel uh, a great heart for these poor people in the country, why don't you become a missionary, go over there and help them learn how to uh, plant and sow and, and become productive in their own country so that their country can prosper and they won't have to want to come to our country. Why not do that? I mean, missionaries from America have done that all over the world. That's a good thing. So to, to burden the civil government and say it ought to be doing these acts of mercy to people who are in desperate need is not the job of government at, at all. And then we see in the 20th century again, in 1906, procedural safeguards for enacting for naturalization. Knowledge of English becomes a basic requirement. If you don't have a basic knowledge of English, we won't even let you off the boat. Sorry. Put you back on the boat, go back to where you came from, learn English. Before you come here, learn English because we're not going to try to bilingually educate you while you're here. Learn English, English before you come. That's a basic requirement. Then in 1907, a head tax was raised. In other words, they had been charging a head tax. Now they are going to increase that head tax. And people with physical or mental disabilities, people with tuberculosis, which was a very contagious disease in that day, and children unaccompanied by a parent are added to the exclusion list. Think of what the Obama administration just did. August 23rd, 12, uh, 12, 12, 13. 
They violated this law because I, I haven't done the research, but I believe this law is still on the books. It has not been rescinded. A child without its parent, that is if they have a legal guardian, sorry, you're not welcome here. You need to return uh, to your own country. I do not believe that is the standard being used today in adjudicating what happens to these unaccompanied minors. No, they're not following this law at all. They don't care about it. They've just jettisoned the law and they are doing whatever they bloody well please is what I think. It's interesting what Japan did there in, in its agreement. But uh, 1910 was a Dillingham report regarding new immigrants from Southern and, and Eastern Europe suggesting that a literacy test be also used to restrict their entry. In other words, they're saying, we want a standard of people coming into the country who are going to be productive citizens as soon as they get here. They're going to help build our country, and if they can't speak English, they can't read, they don't have basic literacy skills, we don't think that's going to be positive. By the way, this list, I didn't put this list together, the list of the folks who put it together uh, there at the bottom, and you can see their bias coming out here thinking that that's an evil thing that uh, you would require a literacy test. I just took their words. I'm just walking through this history because I think it is, is valuable, but I don't agree with their uh, position on, on many of these things. So literacy tests for anyone over the age of 16 coming into uh, the country. And then we have in 21, a quota established. 3% of each nationality present in the United, Na United States in 1910. What they saw is that what we had in 1910 in terms of the various population groups, they believed it would be best for our country to preserve liberty by preserving the percentages from each of those national backgrounds. So, okay, you got this percentage of Italians, let's maintain that percentage of Italian, only 3% increase in the Italians and uh, the Greeks and uh, the Slovaks and so forth, each of the nationality groups. Now, many would criticize that, and I think uh, these authors here are criticizing that, say, that's racist, that, that really isn't good. Think differently, if you would, with me for a minute, about Europe and where liberty flourished in Europe. Primarily, liberty flourished in the northern countries and the western countries. Most of the southern countries embraced some form of dictatorship or monarchy. It was very few, and even if you look at those countries, among those countries, what happened in Germany? Well, there was the rise of the Kaiser, you know, a, a king, essentially, a monarchy, a dictatorship, if you will. And there's only one area of the, of, of the European landscape that you can look at over the history of 2,000 years and say, primarily what was done there, preserve the God-given rights and the liberty of the people. And that turns out is England. You know, France, uh, some major problems that led to the French Revolution. The French Revolution certainly didn't solve those problems of abuse of people's liberty, you know, off with your head if you had the wrong whatever. I mean, you look at Europe, and if you were looking at it just from a, a purely standpoint of liberty, the people who loved liberty and pursued liberty the most were primarily from the northern and the western countries. And so this quota act is much criticized as being a, a racist act, but I disagree for this reason. Liberty is precious. And if you're going to preserve it, you need to be sure that the people coming into your country and the people who become citizens of your country, they love liberty themselves and are committed to preserving liberty as much as those who are already here. 1924, they changed the quota. They reduced it from 3% of each of those nationalities to 2%. So the same cut across the board for all of them. It's interesting that uh, the history of Ellis Island shows that many people began to anglicize their name to get in. You know, they said, well, I'm not, I'm not from Poland. Uh, let me just change my name here. And, and uh, they began to ang anglicize it, realizing that th they could get in under that, uh, uh, that way into our country. Um, and then in 1952, the Immigration and Nationaliz Nationality Act eliminated race. Okay, it says not going to make decisions based on a person's racial uh, 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 background as a bar to immigration, but they did set quotas for certain nations. Japan, only 185 per year. China, 105 per year. Other Asian countries, just 100 apiece. Northern and Western European quota was placed at 85% of all immigrants, and then tighter restrictions and so on. And that was a major point that I believe was being argued. If we're going to preserve liberty, we need to be certain that the people who come here love liberty. And not that a person from China couldn't love liberty, but they have a background and a history in their nation that is not liberty-loving at all. 
Similarly with Japan. In other words, we're going to have to do a huge job to educate that person to love liberty, where those who come from these other countries, they have a history and tradition of liberty. They will most easily fit in with our culture. It's not that the others can't be educated, but it might be a greater challenge uh, to educate them. And then in 53, they expanded the limit to admit 200,000 above the existing limit for refugees. Recognize there, there are people being persecuted around the world who need an option, and we want to be a rescue boat for some of those people uh, that we uh, select. All of that system that was developed and refined in that time period in the history of our nation was attacked in 1965, and I'm gonna share in a moment why I believe in 1965 it was attacked, but the Hart Seller Act abolished all national origin quotas, doesn't matter what country you come from, and it only had separate ceilings for the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere, 170,000, 120,000, uh, and uh, then there were categories of preference based on family ties, critical skills, artistic excellence, refugee status, and so on. But they were eliminating what background and history existed in the lives of the people and saying it doesn't matter whether the people come from a liberty-loving culture and a liberty-loving background. And uh, Ed Kennedy, Ted, dead Ted Kennedy was a big part of uh, getting that thing through uh, that really began to change the complexion of America. And I'm going to share what I believe was behind that in a moment. But just to, to, to look at the rest of the history there, 1978, Separate ceilings were established for Western and Eastern Hemisphere, combining uh, 290,000 per year. Notice how small that number is. If we really needed all these extra workers, why not just change the quota and say, oh, instead of you know, 300,000, we'll take a million a year. I mean, if we really needed it, why not change the law instead of just letting the violation of the law go forward? Why? Because they want to encourage lawbreakers to come into our country. The people who stand in line and say, I want to be part of that 300,000 each year, they stand in line for year after year after year after year. So the law-abiding people are excluded. The law-breaking people are being welcomed into our country. The, the uh, governor of California said that just uh, two weeks ago, I believe it was. He said, we welcome everybody into California. It doesn't matter if you break in here and come in illegally. Not his terms, my paraphrase of what he was saying. But this 1980 uh, uh, Refugee Act, uh, uh, again, furthers that destruction. 86, Immigration Reform and Control Act, a very misnamed piece of legislation. I have great respect for Ronald Reagan in many regards except this. So we were told in 1986, I don't know if you remember, maybe some of you are as old as I am, so you may remember what we were told. We were told this is a one-time amnesty for all the illegals here in America. This is going to solve our problem. All these illegals are going to be made citizens and this will never happen again. Why? Because anybody here is illegally, they cannot be hired by any employer. And we're going to crack down on all the employers that hire these illegals, and they will be so hurt by hiring illegals, they'll never do it again. How's that working? <laughs> Did the federal government live up to its promise of 1986? No. Either it was completely lying to us or trying to do what it had no power to do to control who hires who and uh, whether illegals could be hired. And so we were promised this amnesty would never happen again. But you know what 1986 communicated to the rest of the world? Just break into the United States. You break in, they'll welcome you, and eventually you'll get to be a citizen. So go ahead, just break into the United States because eventually it'll work out. Don't worry. They'll do what they did in 1986. They will do it again. Don't listen to their, their statement that they'd never do it again. Uh, and certainly what we see happening in Congress today Many of the Republicans are on board with, oh, we got to reform immigration. What does that mean? we got to sweep all these people who are here illegally and make them citizens. And Clinton did something in his second re-election. I think the reason he got re-elected a second time was sweeping many illegals quickly through the process of citizenship, not following any of the normal protocols of an FBI background check or anything. Just make them citizens. Why? So they got to vote for Clinton a second time around. In 89... The bill gave permanent status to non-immigrant registered nurses. It was an interesting kind of thing. Okay, we're going to help out certain uh, class of workers because I guess we think uh, we need more of them here in this country. In 1990, Immigration Act limited unskilled workers to 10,000 per year. But if they're coming in illegally, it really doesn't make any difference. By 1990, our, our borders were essentially porous, and they were coming in in droves. So a uh, nice piece of window dressing to persuade the voters that you're uh, going to do something about illegal immigration. But no, nah, nothing really uh, was being done there. And then the Patriot Act in 2001. Patriot Act is very poorly named because it's an anti-Patriot Act, and many provisions of this act are completely unconstitutional. But on the immigration side, this is what they did. 
they said they were broadening the scope of aliens ineligible for admission or, or deportable due to terrorist activities uh, to include an alien who is representative of a political, social, or similar group whose political endorsement of terrorist act undermines the U.S. anti-terrorist efforts, has used a position of prominence to endorse terrorist activity or to persuade others to support such activity in a way that undermines U.S. anti-terrorist efforts or the child or a spouse of such an alien under specific circumstances. Third, has been associated with terrorist organization and tends to engage in threatening activities while in the United States. All that sounds good. It's like, okay. Yes, we don't want to allow terrorists into our country. If we find them, we want to deport them. All of that uh, makes sense. However, like all the other elements that are going on with illegal immigration, are they doing that? No. Who knows how many terrorists have come across the border? Uh, eyewitness accounts of some who live in that part of Arizona say there's plenty of people from other countries, not just Latin America. There's Chinese and there's people from uh, Asia that are... There's, all kinds of people coming across our border from all over the world because they know the easy way into the United States, don't go the legal route, go to Mexico, and from Mexico, start walking north and you'll get into the United States. And now just bring a child along with you and say, oh, I am the guardian of this child. I don't have any paperwork to prove it, but I'm the guardian of this child and therefore let me in. Well, why the change in 1965? A very direct attack, I believe, was taking place. And Trevor Loudon in his book, the enemies within, I think, exposes this agenda, this agenda to fundamentally transform America. Does that phrase sound familiar? Fundamentally transform America into what? Never stated what, but fundamentally transform America. And he provides irrefutable proof that the entire immigration reform movement was the brainchild of American communists. And their goal had long been to establish an unchallengeable political supremacy. That is, if you bring people into this country who are lawbreakers, you bring people into this country who are used to dictatorial, tyrannical governments, you bring people into this country who expect to live their entire life on welfare and receive all sorts of goodies from the government and therefore support the government that gives them these goodies, if you open your doors and you get that message out to the world, what will you get? You will get a country flooded with these people. And what will happen on election day? The people who love liberty will lose every time. And tyrants and dictators and imposters will get into the White House, into the Supreme Court, and into Congress. And the evidence he talks about in this book is that Congress is filled with these enemies of our country who do not love liberty, who have no desire to obey the Constitution in their actions. And so while we have a tradition Give me your tired, uh, those huddled, those yearning to be free, those yearning for true liberty. Our immigration policies in America have been the opposite of that, at least, uh, what's that, the past 60 plus years now? We've turned away from that standard. What's the answer? I believe the answer happens on the local level first. It would be good if we had governors who were willing to take action in their own states against the illegal immigration. Jan Brewer took a step in the right direction and then she said, oh, a federal court has ruled and I can't obey the law because a federal court has ruled. Well, that's not the right answer. The federal court has no jurisdiction over what the state of Arizona does in terms of obedience to the law. No, she should have gone ahead and said, that judge needs to be impeached. Let's uh, get our, our boys down there in the House of Representatives to impeach this federal judge who's violating uh, his or her, I forget which it is, but oath of office. Let's impeach that judge, get rid of him, take him out of Arizona, and let's obey the law. And so I think there's rare governor who has enough steel in their backbone to actually stand up to the illegal immigration uh, fraud that's being uh, perpetrated against us in America. But I think on the local level, you're gonna find people who are willing to do that. And we have sheriffs in this country that are stepping up to the plate and recognizing just because they get an order from Washington, D.C. doesn't mean they obey that order. Why? They took an oath to uphold the Constitution, not to obey whatever Congress says or the president says, well, the imposter in chief says, or, or what a Supreme Court or a federal court says. No, they're going to obey their oath to the Constitution. And that's uh, Chief uh, Sheriff uh, uh, Joe Arpaio had the privilege of meeting him at a Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association uh, about a year and a half ago. What a great hero. And yet his stand that he's taking of arresting illegals and putting them in prison is being attacked by who? The judges, the black robed tyrants of our land. Judge Snow took Arpaio to task in March of this year saying, whether or not the sheriff likes it, there is a distinction in immigration law that was not understood by the population. And with all due respect to you, speaking to Sheriff Joe, it is not understood by the sheriff. 
which is that it is not a criminal violation to be in this country without authorization. Wait a minute. So breaking the law is not a criminal violation? That's what he's saying. These people come into our country. We know they're breaking the law, but that's okay. It's not a criminal violation. Therefore, Sheriff, you cannot arrest them. And Sheriff actually made fun of this judge, which is why the judge dragged him march back into court because uh, somebody made a video of the sheriff talking to his deputies and, and laughing at what the judge Snow was demanding of him to stop arresting illegals in his county. How dare the judge do that? And somehow that video got to the judge, and so the judge was very upset. Well, you have offended me. I am a judge. Don't you know? I'm the God on earth, and you must obey whatever I say, in spite of the fact that what I'm saying is against the law. And so we need sheriffs like Sheriff Joe who are going to say to the federal government, you know what? You can take your rules and flush them where the sun don't shine, but I'm going to obey the supreme law of the land because that's what I took my oath to obey, the supreme law of the land. You see, the real issue is, will those who take the oath abide by their oath? It's to the supreme law of the land. And therefore, if a law is made from Congress or a ruling is handed down by some judge that violates the supreme law of the land, then that is not to be obeyed. Sheriff Joe is right to say, forget it. I'm going to continue to arrest illegals because that's what the law requires of me. I took an oath to obey it, and I will obey and uphold constitutional law in our land. I'm pleased to have my friend Joe, who's running for sheriff in my county, because he is a constitutionalist who believes and loves what the Constitution says and wants to fulfill that oath. And I pray that uh, all over America, Hundreds and thousands of 3,000 plus counties in America will begin raising up sheriffs who will take back our country from the illegals. Now, we might not be able to do it everywhere. I mean, there's certain parts, pockets of the country that are going to continue to foster illegals, but let them. Let's take back our own counties, which is why I was pleased to hear that you're helping out the sheriff there and, and trying to defend the sheriff and standing up for the sheriff because on your local level is the most important place you can begin to act to end the illegal immigration in America. We need to remember that citizens should not, citizenship should not be handed out like candy, which is what our federal government is essentially doing now. It should not be handed out like candy because our liberties will only be preserved by citizens who hold to the American view of law and government. And that's what we teach at an Institute on the Constitution. This American view of law and government is simply put this way. American view says the state is divinely ordained. That is, God is the one who established the law that brought civil government into existence. Its authority is limited. It's limited by what we're given in God's law. It's to do certain things and not to do other things. And this leads to patriotism. I love my country. I honor my country when it obeys God's law, the supreme law of the universe. When it disobeys it, when it murders 60 million unborn babies, I don't praise it. I criticize it. I want to change that. I want to stop that kind of murder. This results in a republic. That is, no one is above the law. It doesn't matter if they live at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. They're not above the law. Nobody in the Supreme Court or con nobody is above the law in a republic because the law is supreme and the law is based on the laws of nature and nature's God. And all of this is really based on creation. There is a creator God. Our rights come from him alone. And the sole purpose of human civil government, according to our Declaration of Independence, is to secure and protect those God-given rights. Nothing else, just your God-given rights. And if government, civil government, federal, state, local, county, were to abide by that rule that's spelled out in our Declaration of Independence, my friends, we would have freedom. We would have true liberty in our land today. Instead, we've got this pagan view of government in play where they believe the state, that is the civil government itself, is God. Now they might not say it in so many words, but you'll hear it leaking out of their decisions in the Supreme Court. They'll voice it in things like in our benighted state of Maryland, where the legislature and the governor and the judges all say, two men can get together and you can call that a marriage. That's not a marriage. I say the only thing you can truly call it is sodomite unmarriage. It's two sodomites doing what God condemns as an abomination. That's not it. You see, when you have a government that believes it's God, it can rewrite the laws of the universe. I mean, what are they going to do next? Write two plus two equals five? Hey, we, we, could, we could suspend the law of gravity. Everybody can go out of this room now and float away because all oh, the legislators suspend the law of gravity. No, that's idiocy. They're not God. And there's a serious day coming when they'll see that they're not God and there'll be hell to pay for it. Because they're not God, their authority is limited. 
It's limited by God's law, and then it's further limited by our U.S. Constitution, our state constitutions. But if, it's, if they are God, then they demand state worship. That is, you dare not criticize them. If you do, we'll put you in the concentration camp. If you do, we'll put you in the mental hospital. There was a case of a, uh, a retired military uh, decorated hero, Brandon Raub in, in, in uh, Virginia, Chesterfield, Virginia, who on his Facebook posts, private Facebook communications with other, other friends, was criticizing Obama. What happened to him is the FBI and Secret Service showed up his front doorship with this county sheriff. He was arrested and he was put into a psychiatric hospital. Why? They were going to say he was insane. Why was he insane? He was criticizing the government. How can you do that? If the government's God, you can't criticize God. State worship. And this, of course, results in tyranny. Nobody has their God-given rights protected. Nobody has liberty. Everybody is a slave of this state, uh, divine state. And really, it's all based on evolution. How's that work? Well, evolution claims not only that we've evolved from these monkeys or so, some, so forth, but that some human beings have evolved ahead of other human beings. And therefore, the less evolved human beings, well, they're supposed to be the servants of the more evolved human beings. And that's what most of the people down there in Congress and the Supreme Court, and obviously that bloated ego in the White House, they believe they're superior to you. They don't have to listen to you. In fact, they make laws that they say they don't have to respond or listen to you. And if you show up at a building where they're having a debate, they'll arrest you because you disagree with them. You're a nobody. They're gods and you're just peons. That's what they believe. In fact, it was dead Ted Kennedy who used to say that people believe <laughs> what I believe, that God's law is supreme. We are Neanderthals. That's his exact word, Neanderthals. He was the superior, more evolved human being. And we were the unwashed masses that he had to rule over because he's God. And you and I are not. So there is a border. Pieces of fence of that border. But not a very secure border, even though parts of it look secure. Because we have a porous southern border. And I believe it's on purpose on the part of those who wanted to see the destruction of our country. And the merger of it into the new world order to accomplish their, what I can only call a satanic dream of world government. And my friends, we can resist and take our government back. But it begins by educating ourselves, which is why I invite you, as Jake shared, if you haven't taken our US Constitution course, you can take it right from here from Harrisburg. You don't have to drive all the way to Pasadena. Starting this Thursday night, Michael Peruca and myself will be teaching that course online as well as uh, in, in Pasadena. We need to educate ourselves. We need to educate others, which is why we put together a host kit. You have the opportunity to take that education and share it with a wide circle of people because if we recover our country, it's first gonna be the first step is educating ourselves and others as to what the law truly is. And then beginning to get involved politically with local sheriffs. Local sheriffs, your first step, if you can recapture the local sheriff's office with somebody who has the American view of law and government, there's hope for your county. There's hope for America, I believe, but that hope has to begin with you and I. We'll take questions or, or comments at, the, at this point. Thank you for your attention. I know it's a little warm and uh, I may have gone a little bit long. Okay, yes, I'll do that, thank you. Questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Open borders right. allows, you know, from Canada through Mexico, it's all like one nation. Mm -hmm. That's another thing I think that they're pushing for. Yes. Yeah, the open borders policy of basically merging Canada, United States, and, and Mexico into North America or whatever they want to call it, and erasing those borders is part of their strategy. Yes. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Indeed, most of their powers have been usurped in name only. Uh, the question is, how can sheriffs participate and actually help this process when most of their powers have been drawn away? Like in, in our county, there is a sheriff, but he's primarily a paper pusher, and he guards the courtrooms and transports prisoners, and that kind of functions. As all. He does no policing. However, in our Constitution in Maryland, it says nothing about the duties of the sheriff. But it does say that English common law is the right of every citizen in Maryland. So when nothing is said about the sheriff, we go back to what does the English common law say about the sheriff? It says the sheriff is the chief law enforcement officer. 
chief law enforcement officer in the county. And therefore, if you elect a constitutional sheriff, like we hope to do in Anne Arundel County, that sheriff can just recapture those powers and communicate to the chief of police. You know, you're commissioned by the county council and you have all the, but you know, I'm following the constitution and I want to put you on notice that I am going to be policing this county according to the standard of the constitution, U.S. and state constitution and the charter of the county. Uh, and don't try to stop me. So basically, if you have sheriffs who have some backbone, they can recapture the powers that are still there constitutionally for their position, but they have been told, oh, you, you don't have those powers anymore. So it takes educating sheriffs uh, to accomplish that. Just real quick, in the 1820 dictionary, if you look up Marshall, U.S. Marshall, it says, we're appointed by the president and approved by Congress under the authority of the county sheriff. Amen. So a federal official cannot do anything in a county unless the sheriff okays it. That's right. So a federal... No power. The FBI, right. ATF, the sheriff can ask him to leave. And, and the proof of that is multiple sheriffs around the country are waking up to this and beginning to resist federal uh, enforcement in their county in Indiana. Elkhart, Indiana, Brad uh, Rogers, Sheriff Brad Rogers. There was a farmer doing the horrible evil of selling raw milk. Oh, this is criminal. And five federal agencies were attacking that farmer, attempting to shut down his dairy farm. Oh, you violated this and blah, 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 blah. Finally, he had enough and he said, he called his sheriff and said, Sheriff, I don't know if you can help me out in this situation, but these federal agencies are out of control and they're trying to shut me down. I said, I'll come out. Came out, inspected his farm, said, there's nothing here that should warrant shutting this farm down. He simply wrote a letter to each of those five agencies and said, in no uncertain terms, I am the sheriff of this county. If you set foot on that farmer's property again, you will be imprisoned and fined for trespass. You are violating the law. And you know what? All, federal, all five federal agencies stopped their action against that farmer. And the farmer went on peacefully selling raw milk. So federal agents, if they know the law, they know the sheriff has that power. There's another incident, I think it was outside of Memphis. My memory serves me correctly, but there was a fire in a barn and the barn had a good bit of gunpowder. Uh, the, the guy was a, one who packed his own loads. And, uh, so it was a kind of dangerous situation. And uh, the sheriff was called, some of his deputies showed up, the sheriff wasn't there. And shortly after the deputies arrived, the BATFE guys arrived from the federal government. And they said to the sheriff's deputies, you could step aside now. We have control of this situation. We're in control of everything from here on, and we'll do the investigations. You can go home now. And the deputies looked and said, that doesn't sound right. So they called their sheriff and said, sheriff, this is what we're being told by the BATFE guys to go home. The sheriff said, stay right where you are. I'll be there immediately. The sheriff showed up and told the BATFE guys, you know, if you'd like an evening at expense of the county, a hot uh, three hots and a cot, we'll be glad to provide it for you. However, if you do not leave this property, that's what we are going to give you. You're going to prison, Phil. And the BFBT, they had never met a sheriff like this. They were outraged. How dare you talk? We're from Washington, D.C. You can't do that to us. But they got on the phone with their boss down in Washington who knew the law, and he said, boys, you better leave that property right now. You're going to go to prison. You're going to go to jail. That sheriff is right. He has jurisdiction. You do not. Unless he gives you jurisdiction in that, you cannot do a thing in that county. Same things happened out there, the sad case in, uh, in, in Nevada. Bundy Ranch, everybody familiar with? If the sheriff had told the Bureau of Land Management, get off the property, you have no business in my county, and take your stinking arms and go home, I'll arrest you if you stay. The whole thing would have never blown into what it did. But the sheriff refused to do his job. Doesn't matter. Legally, right, legally, legally the sheriff has grounds to drive them out and say to the state police, you cannot do this in my county. On the ground, and here's, here's the, the most important thing to remember. The sheriff has something at his beck and call that none of those other agencies do. And that's the citizens of the county. Every citizen of the county under English common law is part of the sheriff's posse. And if I had what I'm supposed to have, I'd live in the criminal state of Maryland where they'd arrest me if I put in here what belongs in there. If he becomes the sheriff, I'll be part of his posse and I'll be helping to build his posse because his posse will ultimately be bigger than any federal force. There's what, 500,000, more than 500,000 residents in around the county. If you have a force of, oh, even a third of that, whatever, you know, 100,000. You're not going to find any federal agency that's going to be able to come against 100,000 well-armed, trained, disciplined posse. 
sheriffs can and should do that. And that's, I believe, what's going to have to happen in some cases to, to tell the tyrant, go back to Washington, we don't want you anymore. What I'm finding out in, uh, in my, you know, my study with this situation with the sheriff in, mm -hmm. in Perry County, and it's a double-edged sword, it's, there's a principle known as Dillon's Rule. Yes. Are you familiar yep. with that? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and for those of you who haven't heard of it, it's, uh, it's based on a Supreme Court case in another state. I forget which Midwest one. Yeah, I do too. Of course, mm -hmm. Dillon issued a ruling that you know, local governments are corporations and they are a creation of the state. Mm -hmm. And that may be what's, I don't know this for a fact mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania, but that may be what's in action here because that, that principle is what we're using to fight our auditors, saying, hey, you can't usurp powers that the statutes, you know, what the, that the county code have not given to you. Mm -hmm. And, and we, you know, the, the citizens, some, some of us have used that uh, as an argument against them. So I don't know what, I don't know what the county code says about the sheriff's power, but and that's how, how it's mm -hmm. interpreted here in Pennsylvania. And, and some county codes may say something specific about the sheriff, but I, I suspect many of them say almost nothing. Right. They just say there must be a sheriff. And in that case, English common law governs what that sheriff does. What our founders, 1828 dictionary talks about the role of the sheriff. And there's a huge work, Anderson's, on sheriffs that talks about the powers of the sheriff. And it is the old time sheriff you imagined in the West that when the bad guys came into town, he had sheriff and two deputies. He couldn't fight the, the gang that came. So he raised his posse. Citizens, they all came together and they went out riding as a posse against the, uh, against the bad guys. Just real quick, and I'm not sure it's in Pennsylvania, but in the state of Maryland, the sheriff's office is actually state office. It's not a county office. Mm. I don't know if you look, if you look at the cars, in the state of Maryland, the sheriff's cars say SA, not LLL. Right, state government. They're state government, so I'm not sure if Pennsylvania is definitely a county office. Mm -hmm. now, I mean, the whole function of a Maryland sheriff is different than a Pennsylvania True. sheriff. Yeah. That, uh, I, I've never been given a speeding ticket by a Pennsylvania sheriff, but I have by a Maryland sheriff. <laughs> 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 Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. I can't find anything in the Pennsylvania Constitution about sheriffs except that it says they're elected. Okay, sheriffs are elected by the Pennsylvania Constitution, but nothing in addition to that. Uh, tight knit presentation. You concluded with a little bit of an attack on the tyrants mm -hmm. in Washington. I would just submit that we put them there. True. And if we let them stay there, then all of this. Mm -hmm. Yes. Every bit of, every bit Amen. I agree. It is our fault that the tyrants are in position that they're in. Sadly, along with that, when you talk about raising the citizens up, a lot of the citizens, and I'm sure people here would agree, they would take the side of the government against the sheriff. I know. <laughs> yes. And brainwash that, well, that guy is nuts. We can't let him. Why, well, he's going against the government. Yeah. <laughs> That's what your school and system's for, to teach the to that. Teach them, so right. Against, and that, and that right. is a good reason to oppo oppose public education and say we need to dismantle that thing. But right. what we need to do is re-educate those who are re-educable. Uh, yes, there are some that we cannot educate who refuse to be educated until perhaps, uh, you were telling me, uh, was it your sister-in-law who's a... My sister. Sister who's a pretty <laughs> solid pretty leftist. Beautiful. And yet, what, she's smacking up against all kinds of rules and regulations that she sees as tyrannical. Yeah. Interesting, because there's an opportunity. When, when they encounter tyranny, they may begin to realize, wait a minute, I thought this was a good idea. Maybe it's not such a good idea. And we might have an opportunity to say, would you be interested in discovering what our founders believed about liberty and, and have an opportunity to educate them? She already knows. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca. Mm. It will be those who support the government that will show up later. So when we're talking about instances where the sheriff is going to be outnumbered by the police, well, the sheriff, first of all, he has the authority in the county. Second of all, if he calls for help, people are going to come. I mean, this, that, this was in the middle of Tuesday afternoon that that many people showed up. Our sheriff knows who to call. Oh, good. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. Before you mention that, can I just follow up on what you just said? Because Sheriff Arpaio has been building a posse for more than a decade. I, I think it may be 15 years or maybe even up to 20 years. He, has, he won't reveal his, his total numbers, but it is known that he has more than 3,000 members of his posse, Maricopa County, Arizona. It's a 3,000 member posse with specialties in many different areas. You may have heard of the cold case. Those that looked at Obama's supposed birth certificate and examined it, it was his posse that did that. Volunteers, no taxpayer dollars expended to do the research and say, this thing's a fraud and we've got the evidence that proves it's, it's, it's a fraud. So the idea, when I share the idea of a posse, people say, ah, that could never happen. Not in 21st century America, that's impossible. Well, Sheriff Arpaio is doing it and there are other sheriffs around the country. We have a friend in uh, Sussex County, Delaware, who's developing a posse in, in that section of Delaware with extreme resistance from the state legislature, the, uh, you know, the state police, everybody is in, in authority, including his own county council, is resisting him, but he's moving ahead uh, nonetheless. So it, it is possible to do that. Go ahead, Rebecca. At all. Yeah. Yeah. If, if that sentence only those born after the eyes of mm-hmm. the um, granted they've used that and they've interpreted that in such a wide uh, way, but in a way it also restricts them from doing whatever. Right. There is, there is some restriction that the 14th Amendment does place. Yes. And, you know, I'd like to unring that bell, but at this point I think it's pretty difficult to unring that bell. Um, Likewise, with some of the other illegally passed amendments, the 15th was passed in the same manner, and therefore the 15th, I don't think, is legitimate. The 16th was passed by a whole series of frauds and deceptions. 17th passed by frauds and deceptions as well, and I've got the evidence, and we, sh- we share that evidence in, in our, cor- our U.S. course. That, so there's four amendments that really, I think, were illegal, and uh, basically, if states wanted to, they could say, we're not going to treat them as, as law. But there is, there is some power of restricting what the federal government does because the 14th Amendment exists. Whether that's a plus for us or not, uh, uh, yeah, it's a toss-up. Until they, (laughs) until the new deal that gives them blanket amnesty to anybody that's illegally in the country, which is what they're all working for, including the Republicans. I mean, people talk about Marco Rubio as, boy, he's a real great patriot, and it's like, wow, he supports this? type of amnesty of some sort or other, I don't agree with it. I'm sorry, you know, people might be a fan of Marco Rubio, but his position on immigration, I, I strongly oppose. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, you've given us a, a timeline of mm-hmm. all uh, material events, you know, leading yeah. up to where we're at right now. And I noticed that, you know, the vast majority of them are all acts or there's an informational, uh, mm-hmm. you know, of, of data. Is the executive order from August 23rd, 2013, uh, that was by a presidential order? Right, presidential that's executive order. One that's modified or, or to be considered modified, the 14th Amendment? I, I'd have to go and look at a wide range of the executive orders because there's all kinds of things in these executive orders that are kind of hidden from us as people because they're not passed by Congress. They're not debated by anybody. The president just puts his moniker on there and says, oh, that's, that's what we're going to do. So did there may be others. Materially, they mm-hmm. materially change the intent of an act? They do not. Right. They the, do not. They apply only to the executive branch. branch the right. And supposedly only to the executive branch of the federal right. branch of the government. Legally, that's what they're supposed to do. However, because Treasury is over ICE and the other immigration forces, it does affect what they do. So the ICE agents are being told, hey, this is, this is, what, the, uh, this is what the rule is now. Pastor, yeah. I, yes. Two, two more quick questions and I want to wrap up. Okay. Well. Yes. Oh, um, I was wondering if you could comment on something that I heard when somebody told me that this, this whole issue really is all about Texas. And, you know, if we can just turn Texas red, then... Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the question of is this really about turning rec- uh, Texas into a red state from a blue state? And I would agree that Texas is one of those swing states that may change everything in terms of, well, 
presidential elections, for example. And so if they can capture them politically and lock them into a leftist mind uh, uh, an election, then yes, the, the whole country will be tilted that way. Because right now, as is quite obvious in the presidential elections, usually we're pretty close. I mean, it's, it's a few this way or that way that, that swing which direction it's going to go in terms of the Electoral College. So yeah, I think there is a good argument to say, and that's why what's happening in Texas is interesting because the governor is resisting and receiving all sorts of pressure from you know, Washington to cave in uh, to the agenda, because if they know if he caves in, then yeah, they would change the complexion of our, our, our electoral process. Yeah. Thank you.